time for our series on Revelations. Seven words to the church today. These wonderful and varied letters that John wrote to the churches of the Roman province of Asia, we've kind of really been reflecting on what God is revealing to our church and to us as individuals through these letters. There are some noticeable similarities in this letter today to the church of Thyatira as to the previous letter that Dave Angtok spoke about last week to the church of Pergamum. He highlighted how too many compromises and accommodations to the outside world led to the church of Pergamum blending in with the crowd, losing their distinctive nature. But really, if we look deeply into these passages and we look at the root cause, it's very different. And the way to tackle these issues is very different too. So don't be fooled by some of the similarities. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to pray and we'll, we'll get into this passage. Lord, thank you for the way that you've revealed your truth to these churches and to our church, Lord. How you continue to reveal your truth to us as individuals. Your truth and wisdom, Lord, is timeless. I, I was reading a great commentary on this passage and it said reprinted in 1981 and I was like whoa reprinted in 1981 how old is this thing but that seemed old but it really pales in comparison to your book the Bible which have we have which holds so much wisdom and truth Lord it doesn't fade it doesn't wear out over time like some may try to convince us putting this stuff into practice literally changes our lives and the lives of others it helps us to grow in our character Lord just help us this morning to open our hearts as we examine your wisdom and your teaching this morning, Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's get into this passage. We're just going to read the whole thing, okay? We're going to read the whole thing, then we'll talk about it, okay? So it says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are doing more now than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from the Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whew. Rough passage, you know. Now, just listening to these verses as a whole, you might think, wow, this is going to be a fun sermon. You know, and I know, I know I did when I first read them. I got, you know, Reverend David Luthy spoke a couple of weeks ago on rediscovering the love of the Lord. And then he goes on holidays and I get this lovely passage, you know. And there's actually a lot here to unpack, okay. There's, it's much more than just talking about s sexual immorality. Because on the whole as a church, I don't think we have anyone in leadership that's doing things along the lines of Jezebel. No offence to the sex appeal of Reverend Luthy. I got him back at least, okay? He might be listening, got to be careful. But uh, there's, there's a lot that we can take from this passage. We don't even have time to look at all of it in detail, but it's, it's the longest of the seven letters. But let's just unpack a little bit we need to understand about what this passage and the context is being written in. So it's set in the city of Thyatira, which was actually a rather small city. Here's a map of Thy Thyatira, where it is. Um, it's about 25,000 to 30,000 people, which is pretty much the population of Brackenridge and Bald Hills put together. If you want to compare it to an Australian town, roughly the population of Lismore or Maryborough or Ballina or Alice Springs, okay? So this is it uh, on the map for the surrounding provinces. And of course, it's in this province of Asia. This is not the continent of Asia, of course, like we have today. Most of us might have heard of maybe Asia Minor before. That's nothing like this either, okay? Completely different. This is the Roman province of Asia. And like kind of later on 
everything east of Europe was called Asia. But back then, it was just this one little area. So Thyatira, it was a pretty small city, but it did, however, have many what they called trade guilds. This includes things like leather workers, wool workers, weavers, bakers, tailors, dyers, candle makers, cobblers, potters, bronzesmiths, blacksmiths, slave merchants, dyers of purple cloth and stone cutters. Basically, a city with a lot of hard-working tradies. Okay, these are just ancient tradies. Okay, so if you're thinking of Thyatira, think of a lot of these guys. You know, this is a stock photo of tradies, so they're probably actors, not tradies, maybe in this photo. But you get the idea. It's a city of tradies. Now, what they had for these, for a lot of these trade guilds, is they had these massive trade guild banquets. These kind of events that not only had a lot of food, which would have been sacrificed to idols, but also plenty of alcohol. And I think most Australian tradies haven't given up on that tradition. But、uh, but after this big party, including plenty of alcohol, you can imagine that often these banquets would degenerate into sexual looseness and other issues as well. So the question is, what were those of the church to do if they wanted to follow the call of Jesus and remain pure? However, they also wanted to remain employed and part of the society. So it's not an easy predicament that many of them found themselves in. The、uh, the passage indicates that the whole problem with the church of Thyatira seemed to stem from this one character, Jezebel. Now it's unlikely that this was the actual name of the lady. It's more likely this was a reference to her character. Like as many of us know, Jezebel was a pretty darn awful lady in the Old Testament. Through her influence as wife of the king Ahab of Israel, she turned Israel away from God. She had many of the prophets of Yahweh killed. She did things like she saw a vineyard that 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 the king Ahab wanted, so she went and had the rightful owner killed, so they could have it for themselves. You know, she was a pretty nasty piece of work, and. The author is signalling the character of this prophetess by calling her Jezebel. Babies in general at that time weren't called Jezebel because of the history. It just wasn't done, you know. It would have been a really bad baby name to give your kid. You ever see those, you know, lists of like ten worst baby names and stuff like that? You know, you can't help but have a little peek sometimes, you know. And maybe I worry a little bit that maybe one of my kids' names could be on there. But I, when I read them, I'm like, oh no, these are like. These are really terrible, you know. I put a few down here, just a quick Google search to have a look. Don't worry, they're not commonly used. I don't think anyone's going to get offended here because I hope that no one's got any of these names. But、uh, these are some of them here. Okay, we've got Elizabeth Maverick, with interesting spelling, and、uh, Beverly, Little Sweet Meat. I thought that wasn't. I was thinking about that for our kid, Little Sweet Meat, Sweet Man. It's just too sweet. I couldn't. I couldn't do it, you know. Colon. A B C D E, melanoma, and larceny. So, in the first century A D, Jezebel would have been on that list. Okay, would have been a really bad baby name. You just don't give that name to your kid. You know. And speaking about children, it's also worthwhile pointing out that the children spoken of in this passage, it's referring to her closest followers. It's not referring to her physical children. Okay. In verse two twenty three, it says. I will strike her children dead, and that's that's harsh. But we're talking about God's judgment on sin. We're not talking about hurting actual children, you know. So what were they doing that was so bad? What did Jezebel lead them into? And it was accepting pagan practices as normal, accepting sexual immorality, and basically worship of idols, spiting the food, as if they weren't a big deal, as if they weren't against the purity and devotion. Of the Church of the Lord, and worse yet, they openly encouraged others to join them in doing, doing so as well. And the big reason why these influences got hold so much was because they were permitted by someone who was influential inside the church. It gave a confidence to these indiscretions. Oh, just just live a little, have some fun, just enjoy yourself, you know. And it kind of reminds me of when a a company put up billboards saying, "Life is short, have an affair." Just to such a shallowness and absolute selfishness to these practices, and they were being spread through the church itself. So it was a massive, massive problem. Something this passage also kind of focuses on are the the consequences to these practices. You know, and these are the parts that we kind of recoil from a little bit because they just seem so unpalatable. 
to the 21st century, right? Cast her on a bed of suffering. Make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Noting that this is referring to spiritual adultery mostly, not, not primarily physical, although sexual immorality was part of the problem. These are, these are very harsh, but, but, but righteous punishments. However, I want to focus on, do you notice that the offer is still right there to repent? The judgments are rightfully tough, but mercy is not far away. It says, unless they repent of her ways, repenting of what she has taught them so they can be instructed in the right ways of Jesus. This is from he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. The writer focuses on the deeds, but also for the fact that the motivations of the heart and mind are being searched too. So I think, I think we've got a pretty good idea about what this passage is saying, what's trying to be communicated. So how does that affect us? What does that mean to us here, individuals, as part of Brackenridge Baptist Church? And I'm just going to leave you with two points, okay? Two points that I want to focus on. I think um, Simon Ward from Compassion was here four weeks ago. He just gave one point, but I believe you guys can do two, okay? We can do two this morning. The first one is we need to be careful who we listen to. There's a lot of voices trying to influence us, and they can all sound attractive, but some can be very dangerous. In 2.20 it says, By her teaching she misleads my servants. Satan wants to mislead us. How is he going to do it? Do you think he's going to tell you straight up? <laughs> of course we wouldn't listen then, but he's a lot smarter than that, and there's a lot of ways he has of achieving his influence into our lives. Now, sometimes there's, uh, there might be some people in your lives who you look at and you're like, oh, wow, they're just really easily influenced. And I've got to be careful here what I say here, but my mum is a little bit like that sometimes. She's down there. But be a little bit careful what I say here. She's a very clever lady, but she can be a little bit, a little bit gullible sometimes, okay? So don't go telling her weird stuff now that I've said that, okay? She's, she'll be on to you, okay? Now, one example I have, there's many through childhood. One example I want to reveal today is that uh, she always told me never to put my soft drink can down because the wasp will crawl inside and when I drink it it's going to crawl down my throat and bite my throat which will swell up and I will die. <laughs> now she was probably told that sometime or read it sometime so I'm not sure how she found out but I don't know if it was worth terrorizing your children with that story. <laughs> We, we never died of, do of oxygen deprivation from a wasp thing, so she was successful um, to some ways, so I will give her that. But uh, and some people we might look at and go, oh, they're very easily influenced. Maybe young people you're looking at, oh, they're so easily influenced. But whether we want to admit it or not, we're, we're all influenced. <laughs> the question is not, am I being influenced? The question is, who or what are we allowing ourselves to be influenced by? Now, I don't think many of us here would be influenced by the influences. You know, you know who I mean? The ones on Instagram, TikTok, and the likes. I'm, I'm not young enough to have Instagram and TikTok, but I'm young enough to know what they are, kind of thing, okay? And um, for some, maybe for some younger people, that might be a cause for concern. For us, I don't think that's a big impact on us. But personally, I do read a lot of news articles, more than I probably should, and it has, uh, probably has more impact than I realize sometimes, you know? If I'm not conscious what I'm actually digesting, you know, a lot of news articles will have sometimes an obvious bias in it, and I think we need to be conscious of that. We need to be conscious of the bias. It doesn't mean that we just disengage altogether, but we need to be aware of how much that's influencing us. One of the concerning effects I see of media influence sometimes is just really stirring a fear. I talk to a lot of people in um, my optometry practice, and they're, they're worried, they're unhappy, they don't like what this political person did or what this other person said and their spirits all riled up and they're unhappy by these influences but it's mostly just hubris over something fairly insignificant there's a lot of fear you know house prices are skyrocketing oh no house prices are falling there's interest rates are too low or oh, interest rates are going to be too high stock markets plunging credit crunch inflation stagflation it seems everything is just on the edge of collapse when our reality in Jesus is far from that, our future is secure. 
Sure, look, these economic affairs, they, they affect people, we're sensitive to that, but they shouldn't induce a crippling fear in us. We know the future of the world. We're children of the living God. Who do we listen to? We need to go to the source, you know, and uh, the first way we need to listen to is through, through prayer, through worship, through the Bible itself. But there's other ways, there's other influences in our lives, many positive ones. I love to listen to a, a really good Tim Keller podcast. For some, it can be time in nature, reading certain authors, a great mentor that helps them to navigate their life, true friends that are willing to be truthful and helpful to them. I'm not here to tell you exactly where your best influence is, but I can tell you that you need to be careful who we listen to. You need to be careful who we listen to. Okay, that's point one. Another thing we need to be careful of, second point is, really importantly, the gospel of Jesus is sufficient. You don't need to add anything. Life is complex, but the call of Jesus is simple. Some of those in the church of Thyatira were getting duped into believing that you needed to add more, but you don't. They already had love and faith, service and perseverance. They thought, oh, so what if I eat some food that has been used in worship to other gods? Why shouldn't I have sex with who I want? I still want the gospel, but I want to add other stuff to it. I want to have everything I want. And it's easy maybe for us to fall into a, a kind of similar trap to think, yes, I believe in the gospel, but to be really fulfilled, I need to have, be a little bit more successful. I need to have a little bit more wealth. I need to have a better relationship with my partner. I need to have better friendships. I need a nicer house. And while none of those things are necessarily bad, they're simply not necessary for the complete fulfillment that comes from the gospel. Jesus being in your life right now is all you need. His goodness is unaffected by our circumstances. And to put it another way, no matter what circumstances are thrown at you, the good news of Jesus Christ will always be sufficient. It doesn't mean things aren't difficult at times, trust me. I just had man flu, I know what it's like. But the gospel was always, will always be sufficient. When you have a root canal, the gospel is sufficient. When you have disappointments in your career, the gospel is sufficient. When financial worries are getting you down, the gospel is sufficient. When you have issues in friendships, the gospel is sufficient. When you are hurtfully wronged, the gospel is sufficient. When you lose someone you love to cancer, the gospel is sufficient. We don't need anything else. We've got a lot of stuff, but don't let that turn into what you need because you don't. Adding anything else actually just dilutes the value of this beautiful gospel. So we need to hold on to the sufficiency of the gospel. And this next verse is a wonderful verse from Revelation 2.25. It says, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. It might seem like Jesus asks a lot of us sometimes. When you consider the rewards on offer, it isn't all that much. He isn't trying to burden us, but imploring us to hold on. And I feel that's something that we need to be encouraged by this morning. We want to be careful who we're listening to. We want to be assured in the sufficiency of the gospel. We want to hold on to the love and faith, the service of per and perseverance that many of these churches were commended for. And I think God would commend our church for that as well too. So we're going to hold on to those things. I'm just going to pray for us as the worship team comes back and, uh, and we'll just sing some songs and reflect on this as we worship our God. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your gospel is sufficient, Lord. Thank you that we don't need anything else, Lord. Help us to, to not try to add anything else to it, Lord, to come to you and only to you, Lord. I just want to Acknowledge, Lord, the wonderful influences in our lives, Lord, that you've put in our path, Lord. Not all influences are bad. We've had, many of us have had some excellent influences in our lives that have pushed us forward, that have pushed us towards you, Lord, towards your goodness, Father. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy is near. Even for those that have fallen under bad influences, Lord, which we all have at some point, your mercy is near 
Your love and your grace is astonishing, Lord. It takes our breath away. We love you, God. We want to look to you. We want to look to you to fill us, Lord. We want you to be our guide as individuals and as a church as a whole, Father. We want to experience the life, freedom, and hope we have in you, Lord. Thank you that you have put these good influences in our lives, Father. Help us to continue to be careful of who we're listening to. Help us to be assured of the goodness and sufficiency of your gospel, Lord. We just want to hold on until you come again, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen.